Uh, good morning, everyone. You you are, you listen to me? It's okay on the Zoom. So I see more and more people connecting. So good morning. Uh, I'm Michael Badawi from uh, University of Lorraine. I'm working in the group of Dario Roca and uh, maybe more on computational materials. And uh, so I'm very happy here uh, to uh, to share this uh, last session for this week dedicated to machine learning. And uh, so to, to start our session, we, uh, we welcome Militia Todorovic, which is a professor in the University of Turku in <laughs> Finland, right? And uh, so uh, Militia is uh, an expert in uh, surface science and uh, she applied first principle simulation to, uh, to materials and uh, she combined also this simulation with uh, methods derived from artificial intelligence and uh, like active learning or Bayesian approach. And also I see that you, you work also with some expertise people on surface characterization, uh, microscopy, IFM, STM and so on. So, so well, we will have very happy uh, to listen to you. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Michael. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's nice to, to see people following on Zoom and uh, good morning to you in the lecture theater. So my name is Milica. Um, as Michael said, I'm a professor of computational materials engineering at the University of Turku in Finland. And uh, today I would like to tell you a little bit more about how we use active learning, machine learning techniques to carry out some engineering of, of materials. So uh, let's start. Um, I'm gonna start very broadly. I'm a computational material scientist. Uh, so from my point of view, uh, we study a lot of different kinds of functional materials that are used in devices. So if you look at organic optoelectronics, you might find lots of molecules that's up to surfaces and they're optically active. Phase change memories, you might find high, high entropy alloys, or comple other complex materials. Now people are looking into biodirect fuels such as nanocellulose. And then there's these organic and organic uh, perovskites, which have proven to be powerful solar cells. Uh, so from the point of view of computational materials engineering, um, our objectives are always to refine these materials and optimize their performance in devices and, and therefore also optimize technologies. So how do we do this? In my group, I use electronic structure calculations uh, to simulate these materials. And we're always looking to learn what is their structure and, and what are their functional properties. And as you perhaps know, the structure, the atomistic arrangement um, inside the material critically determines the functional properties. So we're always looking to learn this structure to property relationships. So when machine learning came along, we got very excited because uh, it was really a good tool for learning structure to property relationships. And in many of the talks this week, you have already heard how this can be done. So in one of our early works, we were mapping the structure of small molecules uh, to some functional property, uh, considering kind of light emitting materials and applications. So first we used a machine learning model called kernel ridge regression, which you may have heard of, um, to map the structure to the energy levels of electrons in the, the uh, molecules. And this is of course related to how they absorb or emit light. And this worked reasonably well. So then we proceed to, to uh, use artificial neural networks to map molecular structure onto entire optical spectra. Uh, because of course this is related to applications and this worked also reasonably well uh, now the the trained neural network model becomes a resource because you can query it for many different spectra in fact uh, samsung called us up about this and they wanted to learn this pre-trained model uh, because they're always looking for new candidate molecules for their led tv screens so how would samsung want to use this model for example let's say they they uh have a specification for, that, they, that they need the molecules to emit or absorb light at a particular wavelength lambda, right? So then they use this pre-trained neural network models. Um, they input uh, thousands or tens of thousands of possible candidate molecules, and they, uh, they uh, review their spectra, and they consider which molecules have the spectrum uh, peaks in, these, in this region. And then they, they infer which type of molecular structures uh, correspond to these, and then they can go and, on and study them in the lab. But this is a really, for us, from a scientific point of view, really unsatisfactory way to go about it. Ideally, we want to specify a functional property and, and compute immediately the optimal solution. And what instead we had to do is we had to pre-train an entire neural network 
with tens of thousands of molecules. So to go from, from structure to property, only so that we can later use it to go from property to structure. And uh, you may realize where this is going. This brings us to a lot of the challenges uh, related to machine learning that we quickly found out ourselves. Uh, forward mapping is easy, but backward mapping is difficult. And by forward mapping, I mean uh, learning structure to property relationships and backwards is, is property to structure. Uh, and we wanted to know if there are if ways to directly infer the optimal solution. And then another thing that, that we realized is that we had to, to train these models, we had to use pre-computed data sets. And that was really limiting us because after training, if the, the performance uh, of the models is not good enough, uh, it was difficult to systematically improve it. You could try a different machine learning model or a different descriptor, but ultimately uh, to really improve the model, you need to add more materials into the data set or more data into the data set. And there was no way to systematically improve the data set. And indeed, to this day, there is really no guidance on how to assemble good data set if you want to, to make one for your own purpose. And this is what led us to, uh, to the autonomous optimization techniques uh, and concretely active learning that I will present now. So let me describe a little bit how we used active learning in material science or how it can be adapted for, for material science. The tool we use the most is called Bayesian optimization. Uh, it's a statistical tool uh, commonly used in computer science to uh, minimize black box functions or to find, find optimal solutions for them. It's famous for this taking the human out of the loop. Uh, so it, it's supposed to be entirely data-driven optimization without any human bias. Um, and the way it works is that it builds most probable uh, surrogate models for a black box function given some data, and then it finds the, the optimum. And here on the right, you see the typical diagram of how this works, it's an iterative process. You don't need a very large data set to start. This is how it's different from traditional machine learning. So uh, you just need a few data points. And then uh, Bayesian optimization takes these two different steps. Uh, step one is Bayesian regression, where this data is fitted uh, in a Bayesian way with the distribution over functions. Um, and after you do the fit, you're able to evaluate the acquisition function, which will tell you where to acquire the next data point for maximum benefit. So after this, you can evaluate this in computation or experiment, you add it to the data set, and then this process repeats itself iteratively. And uh, I want to stress that uh, this tool is, is uh, classified as active learning because the machine learning model is being uh, fitted at the same time as the data set is being assembled. In traditional machine learning, you pre-compute the entire data set before you start, uh, but here you acquire the data on the fly and the machine learning model helps you to acquire the data. It directs the data acquisitions, but at the same time, the model is being trained. So this is, this is the, the essence of, of what is active learning. So these two processes uh, are ongoing at the same time. Okay, so uh, Bayesian optimization, uh, the first step is Bayesian regression. Uh, uh, so fitting the data with the surrogate model. And what we use to fit the data are Gaussian processes. Uh, and this is a, a well-known tool for applied mathematics, but it's not so familiar in our field. Uh, so Gaussian processes is to have two uh, forms. Before you know any data, you only have a Gaussian process prior as I show here on the left. Um, so Gaussian process prior is a distribution over functions. One of them is going to be our final solution, but before we know any data, we don't really know which one it is. So what you're seeing here in the prior is just samples from the Gaussian process uh, of all the possible curves and what they might look like. Uh, but the minute you get some data, uh, you can apply the Bayes theorem uh, to this Gaussian process prior and compute the Gaussian process posterior. So that is the fitted form of the Gaussian process. And here you can see some data points. And what this process did is it, uh, it took all the possible functions that could be our solution from the prior, and it collapsed the space of possible solutions to only those that pass through these data points. So now you can see that there are still very many solutions because away from this data, we don't know what the function looks like. They are marked here in dashed line. But what we do know is they have to pass through these data points. So then what is commonly done is we compute the mean of all these possible solutions. That's the full line and that's called the posterior mean. And that's statistically the most likely uh, function given only two data points. Uh, and then the span of, of the space uh, uh, spanning all, all these possible solutions is called the posterior variance. 
And this, this somehow describes the confidence of the model in this posterior mean. So if the model is very confident, the variance vanishes, like here through the data points, we know here that the model is correct. But away from the data, we, we know very little about the, the, the functions. So the variance is large and the confidence is low. And that's how it works. Um, so any two points on this, two, on, on this uh, Gaussian process are, are kind of a normal distribution and they are correlated in some way with the covariance function. And there's a covariance matrix of which each element is actually a kernel. And here I show uh, a, a Gaussian kernel or the, uh, the radial basis function kernel, which is very commonly used in Gaussian uh, in invasion optimization. So this kernel is really necessary to describe the look of this function. And what really controls it are two hyperparameters, the signal variance and the signal length scale. Uh, the signal variance controls how fast the function can move up and down uh, on the y scale. And, and uh, the signal length scale, which, which enters into this exponent of the Gaussian, uh, describes how many minima it can have on the, the, the x scale. So, uh, both of this really change the look of the function. Uh, luckily for us, uh, we don't need to set these hyperparameters. They are automatically calculated uh, at the same time as the model is fitted by a process called optimizing the marginal likelihood. So this is a standard part of uh, Gaussian process regression and implemented in many packages. So we don't have to worry about the hyperparameters. What happens is as we add more data, this model improves and converges. And then um, at the same time, these hyperparameters can be observed to converge. And then when we see the convergence, we know that the model is of high quality. So we don't need to set these hyperparameters, but we do need to monitor the convergence. Okay, so now we have fitted our uh, Gaussian process to the data and uh, computed the posterior mean and variance. So next we need to evaluate the acquisition function to tell us where to acquire the next data point for maximum benefit. So first you have to think what is the maximum benefit in your case. In some cases we want to find out the global minimum of the function as fast as possible with as few evaluations as possible. But sometimes you may wish to learn the entire uh, landscape across the entire search space as fast as possible. So there are many acquisition functions and um, usually we'll have to evaluate it, find where it takes the minimum and then, uh, uh, and then uh, sample the next data point in that location. So I'm going to introduce the one that we use very often, which is exploratory lower confidence bound. And here it is written out. So what you see is it has only two terms on the left is the posterior mean, which is just computed with Gaussian process regression. And then uh, from that, we subtract a factor multiplying the posterior variance, which is another property of the Gaussian process posterior we've just computed. So it is no accident that there are these two terms. Um, if uh, they do different things. So if we forget about the, the right-hand one, and uh, if we were to acquire the next data point where this uh, posterior mean takes a minimum, well, that's the location where the current global minimum prediction is. And the idea behind it is that if we look around the current global minimum and we sample nearby, we might find an even better uh, lower um, signal. And, and this is called data exploitation. So acquiring in the low energy regions already. And this is always a good strategy. For example, if you're on a slope and you go left or right, there's a 50-50 chance that you'll go down in energy. So, so that's a good strategy. And then if we forget about the first term and look at the minus posterior variance term, well, we would have to take a data point where that is um, the minimum, which is where the posterior variance is large. And if you see on this plot, the, the variance is largest where we have no data. So this term drives exploration, data exploration, or acquiring new data points in previously unexplored regions. And when you put these two together, uh, you can see that sometimes you do a bit of exploitation, a bit of exploration, and that's a very efficient way to, to minimize your function, or to find the minimum function of the function fast. So here's uh, an example in one dimension of how this works. We've computed a true function in blue. It's a function of angle, energy is a function of angle. And you can see it's not entirely trivial. There's a global minimum here and a local minimum here. So as we start sampling, uh, you don't need much data. Let's start with three data points. And the black function is the current fit, probabilistic fit, the most likely function given this data. It's not very good. Uh, it thinks the global minimum is here where the green line is and it's way off, but the uncertainty is off the chart. So it, the model is not confident at all. 
So as we go from three points to six points, what we will do is acquire a couple of points near this global minimum uh, region. That's the exploitation part. And you see here, we've acquired these two points on either on both sides of the, the current minimum. And now this has improved our model function considerably in the region of the global minimum. And in fact, we've already found the global minimum with the six points. And then uh, it, one data point was taken here around uh, 50 degrees because this is where the uncertainty was the highest. So this was the exp exploration part, right? So overall with six points, the, the uh, global minimum was found, but the uh, model function is not yet converged. So if you continue taking points, you will see that, the, that you can reach the conversions as well. So let's go from six points here to nine points here. And now the model tries to take again a point near the global minimum or two points, and it has done so here, but it can no longer improve on this region. It learns the curvature a little bit better, but no new information is coming. Uh, nevertheless, we do take another point here where the uncertainty was high. And now you can see that we've, we can correctly reproduce the local minimum as well. And uh, after this nine points, already the model has converged in one dimension and you can take more points, but uh, very little will change. And now from this surrogate model, you can just extract all the minima regions and you can recover this information very fast. So the way I describe this in 1D is exactly the way it works in n dimensions with two, three or more. Um, so this summarizes more or less this process, how Bayesian optimization works. So uh, what we are really interested in is the outcome of this Bayesian regression, this converged surrogate model. You can use it to build models for materials energy or functional properties or any, any kind of thing. Uh, we often look at energies because we are interested in structure search. So then we extract these minima and they are the local and global minima for for material structures in nature. Um, in any case, this does give us, gives us a functional relation between structure and energy, and it allows us to zoom in immediately to the, to the uh, correct solution. So we have implemented this Bayesian optimization into this uh, Python code called Bayesian Optimization Structure Search, or BOSS. And here we plug in some data source. So usually it's total energy simulations uh, from the high performance supercomputer. This is where we run this code. And uh, we frequently work with large molecules or large or complex substrates. And uh, we employ this building block approximation where we keep parts of the molecule fixed and then uh, parts of the system fixed. And then uh, after doing the Asian optimization, we can do full relaxations. So now I wanted to tell you uh, a, a little bit about different kinds of applications we've done. Now we've done some conformer searches, uh, molecular absorption problems, or steady thin film growth, even solid solid interfaces. And lastly, recently we've ex applied this method to optimize experimental outcomes. And I wanted to show you a little bit about each one of these examples so you can see how versatile this method is. Um, it can be applied to very many different problems. Um, and all you have to do is think about what are your key degrees of freedom and what is your search space. So after seeing all of these examples, I hope you will be thinking about how these tools could be applied to your own problems as well. So let's start with uh, how, to, how to use active learning in some computational work. One thing that we are always interested in because of these uh, functional interfaces are our molecules on surfaces. So how, how does the contact form between the molecule and the surface? And one of the earliest studies we've done is molecular adsorption, where we were looking for minima over adsorption energy as we position the molecule uh, differently above the surface and as we change its orientation. Uh, and the way the active learning works is it samples in an automated way, many different structures. So you can see these acquisitions in the left, that's the movie here. And then at the same time, it's building the, the uh, six dimensional model for the energetics of adsorption, and it's extracting the global minimum. And uh, you see what you see here top down is the current global minimum structure as the sampling progresses. So as the sampling progresses, we know no, more and more about the, the energy landscape and we can determine the global minimum with more accuracy. So that's how it works. Um, after this, we wanted to, to do this in more practical way. Uh, and uh, as, as Michael said, we, we work a lot with uh, our AFM colleagues and they were looking to image uh, camphor on copper 111. They deliberately prepared their sample to see a camphor in different configurations of adsorption. But when they imaged them, they found they couldn't quite determine what were the configurations. The images were very blurry and they couldn't identify the atomistic structure underneath. So we did uh, exactly what you saw in the previous slide. We put uh, this camphor molecule on the copper 111 surface and we were looking for adsorption 
energy minima uh, as, we, as we change the position and the orientation towards the surface. Uh, and this was, of course, all done with, uh, with Apadishio, the density functional theory and, and um, dispersion corrections. So here you can see again the same movie. Uh, here on the left, you can see how uh, the boss runs structural sampling in an automated way on the high performance supercomputing uh, platforms. And uh, at the same time, we are learning about what is the global minimum structure. And in this case, uh, uh, the copper 111 has six fold surface symmetry. So the global minimum uh, is the same in six directions. So sometimes you see the structure jump. Uh, after converging the entire six dimensional model, we extracted all the local minima we could find, and then we relaxed all the structures. And here you can see eight unique structures uh, that we've extracted, uh, ranked from uh, most strongly adsorbed on the left to the weakly adsorbed on the right. And immediately we saw that there were two categories in these most strongly, five most strongly adsorbed ones, the oxygen was pointing down towards the, the copper surface, and in the other three structures, it was pointing up. And indeed, when we checked the electronic structure of the systems, we found that the covalent bond was forming here on the left. And these, these molecules were chemisorbed and more strongly anchored to the surface. While these top three, they were more physisorbed and they could rotate in place very easily. And so when, when we looked at the AFM image, we thought that, that this one here that looks like a, like a, a windmill uh, was was more this kind of weakly adsorbed molecule that was rotating in place, and you can see the six spokes because of the six-fold uh, symmetry on on copper one one. And so these images that didn't move were more maybe more small better candidates for the um, the matching the the chemisorbed structures. But in order to really determine what what was behind. Uh, we had to do some simulated AFM on each one of these molecules. We had to simulate a stack of images to imitate the tip approaching the surface. And then we compared it to the stack of images obtained from exactly the same experiments. And this was the result. So here are the three best matches uh, between the simulated AFM in the middle column and the experiment on the left. And you can see the simulated AFM is just as blurry and indistinguishable as the experiment. But you could, uh, uh, if, you, if you do some analysis, you can see that there are some bright features and we could analyze their length and orientation and compare them to experiments. And this is how we found the best matches. And now you can really look at this model of the, the, the adsorbates behind these images. And these are one of the, the lowest energy uh, adsorption energy structures. And they could really tell which atoms were behind these features. So uh, this kind of identification in, in experimental images is difficult to uh, obtain without some uh, ab initio structure search, but the ab initio structure search without active learning would have been far, far more laborious. Okay, so now let's look at an, a different example. Uh, let's say that you have studied already your molecular absorb uh, molecules absorbing to the surface. Uh, this is what we did in collaboration with Oliver Hoffman. We were looking at TCNE absorbing to copper 111 again. And Oliver's code sample uh, analyzes the, um, the uh, potential absorption sites on the surface, and he used it to build this monolayer structure, which is the most favorable monolayer. But now after the monolayer forms, the question is, how does the second layer form on top of this? And now all the adsorption sites have been saturated on the surface. So where are now the adsorption sites on top of the first monolayer? So what we did is we took this uh, unit cell of the monolayer and we, uh, we did a structure search uh, of TCNE on top of this monolayer only in terms of position above the surface and some orientation uh, in terms of angles. And we found the lowest energy structures. And uh, this is how we knew that the next molecule would absorb flat on top of these uh, uh, perpendicular molecules in the region where the molecules don't quite connect. And then this, this next molecule sees a little bit of the copper surface. So this was obtained by geometry optimization. And now that we know how the second layer was built, we could understand how the charge transfer penetrates from the, uh, from the inorganic substrate into the organic layer in some kind of functional device. Uh, another thing that we were interested in is how to how to uh, find do structure search for solid solid interfaces. Our colleagues were looking at perovskite substrates, which are unstable in air and they need some kind of coating material to protect them. Uh, 
And so they found some good candidate coatings, but uh, they didn't know how best the, the coating and the, the substrate would absorb to each other. So what we did is a simple registry search. We moved the coating around uh, the surface uh, in just X, Y, and then we found these kinds of energy landscapes for the binding energy between the coating and perovskite. And we quickly learned uh, what was the, uh, the global minimum location. And then we could put the coating on top of the perovskite and just relax everything and find the, the interface structure that forms between them. And after we did this, we could study the level alignment uh, of an electronic levels on the coating and the perovskite. And this is important for charge in understanding the charge injection across this interface, which of course is important for a solar cell uh, application. And I, I want to draw your attention to the fact that with different coatings, you can really obtain different kinds of energy landscapes here between the substrate and the coating. Uh, because this is in two dimensions, very few DFT calculations are needed to just obtain these landscapes. Of course, you have to relax it afterwards. But in, in this case, in the left, um, you get a minimum across the entire line, which means that the coating can be moved uh, along this minimum and, and you obtain equally good contact. Um, and then in other kinds of coatings, we observed that there was only one minimum and, and there was no other good way to align these two samples. Um, so these are different things you can learn from, from active learning. Okay, and last computational example is about flexible small molecules, because these are always very important in many technologies. Uh, we tested on alanine, uh, which is very small, but it has many different known minima. And we quickly realized that these uh, functional groups typical of um, amino, uh, amino acids, so the amino group, the, the methyl group, carboxyl group, they won't really change their shape. What will change is the, uh, the, the torsional angles between these different groups as, as the conformation change. So we fixed these into building blocks, and then we started some active learning. And again, you see how this works for a molecule. So uh, with four different torsional angles, the uh, boss is simply sampling many different structures, and again, building the energetics models in 4D. And from here, you see the current prediction for the global minimum. And here you can see how the energy of this structure varies as we sample more and more configurations here. So in the beginning, you see the prediction is not very good, but then as we, as we see more configurations, the energy goes down in plateaus. And then after about 90 structures we have seen, the energy no longer changes. And now this is this, the final structure of the global minimum. And indeed, if we look at the literature, this is, this is the one. Um, I should stress that this was all performed with amber force fields. So you can use any kind of energetics you want in, in your structure search. But of course, the quality of your final result will depend on the accuracy of the method you're using. So this is how that works in molecules. Uh, we then moved on to study more complex systems. Our uh, colleagues at Aalto University in Finland were interested in these ligand protected uh, nanoparticles. And uh, they are considered for, for health and drug delivery applications, but their functionality critically depends uh, how they interact with the environment, depends a lot on the configurations and the conformations of these external uh, ligands. And so we focused on one such ligand, cysteine, and we wanted to find many different minima. Uh, so uh, we, did, we employed, again, different levels of uh, accuracy here, DFT, and also some quantum chemistry. And because uh, of the very efficient sampling, we could, uh, we could get away with some quantum chemistry as well. So what I'm showing you here are the, uh, in, in five dimensions, uh, we extracted lots of different local minima, and, and they are shown here. So this top row are the lowest energy ones, and then the bottom row are the higher, higher energy ones. So these were extracted at reasonably high levels of theory, so sophisticated dispersion and, and a hybrid functional. So immediately we saw that these, uh, these structures in red were the ones that were measured in experiments. So it's really good to know that in, in uh, some active learning search with a few DFT calculations, you can recover all of the, uh, the experimentally measured structures just for one, from one uh, active learning search. And then the other ones uh, we found were also uh, found in other computational studies before. And then we even found some new ones, but they were higher in energy. So we're not sure that they're really useful. Um, so we wanted to know if this is somehow general. So we applied these approaches to other similar molecules. So serine uh, and tryptophan are also 5D, uh, five dimensional systems. So they have five torsional bonds. And aspartic acid here has six torsional bonds. So again, we performed an active learning, a single active learning search for all of them until the energy models converged and, and we extracted all the local minima. 
And we found that for seven, uh, all the seven experimentally measured conformers were found in the nine lowest energy structures. And similarly for aspartic acid, um, they had measured six uh, experimental conformers and, and we found these in the eight lowest energy structures. And in tryptophan, uh, there were several hydrogen bonding types and, and there were two that were experimentally confirmed to be lowest, lowest energy and, and these are the ones we found as well. And I want to stress that to converge these energy landscapes in 5 and 6D and to extract all the minima, it took only about a thousand DFT calculations. Uh, so this is relatively fast for sampling because typically these uh, conformer search problems are cracked with genetic algorithms and minima hopping. And the typical amount of structures you need to compute there is about 10,000. So we, we were able to, to reduce this by an order of magnitude approximately, and this is due to this smart sampling um, that creates maximally informative data sets. Okay, I want to quickly go on and mention some applications of active learning in experimental work. Uh, basically, we realized that this is a powerful optimizer and you can optimize structures and optimize properties. Uh, so then we wanted to learn if we could optimize experimental outcomes. And, and uh, what we started with is experiments on, on tannic acid nanoparticles, which are bio-derived. And we wanted to adjust the processing conditions so we can preferentially create 1D particles or 3D particles. So that was the task from our experimental colleagues. So this was chemical synthesis of tannic acid and they put it in solution where they could vary two parameters, uh, pH and pKa of the solution. So that's, those are our experimental variables. And they created uh, several uh, um, samples which they characterized by taking SEM images uh, and they showed some particles and then we measured from the SEM images their dimensions. And we took these dimensions for the data points and we, we turned them into data points on particle morphology. And then we put this into Gaussian process regression to compute a surrogate model. Only this time, the surrogate model is for particle morphology in the phase space of these two variable experimental uh, parameters. So you can see pH on the x-axis and pK on the y-axis. And what, we, what the model predicted is that if you have high pH pKa environment in the solution, you would make 1D tannic acid particles. And if it's a kind of a less severe, a milder environment, low pH pKa, you would get um, 3D particles. And then indeed, when we looked at the samples again, uh, we found that indeed all of the 1D samples were in this region. And then uh, the 3D samples is exactly how, how this looks like. And then in the middle, you could find all kinds of variations, sometimes a platelet and sometimes really short matchstick 1D, uh, 1D particles. Um, so this was a really useful outcome, even though this is not a very sophisticated use of Gaussian process regression and surrogate models. Um, before experimentalists had only an intuition of how they would make 1D or 3D particles. But after fitting this model with actual experimental data, they could then give this to their community and then people could use this. So if they wanted to synthesize 1D, they knew which then uh, experimental variables they needed to select and then the, the, they could guarantee um, obtain the, pref the, the particles that they want for some application. But uh, the real power of active learning is, of course, uh, uh, the data acquisition or the, the data acquisition strategies. And this can be used to tell the experimentalist which experiments to perform uh, to uh, obtain their solution with as few experiments as possible. And this we applied to lignin engineering from wood. So the experiment was to put lignin in, in water and heat it. This is called hydrothermal treatment. And then you extract some lignin with acetone and you get your samples and lignin is very difficult to characterize. So they put it in the NMR and all they could see were different functional groups or different, for different lignin chemistries. And the question was how to adjust the processing conditions of this to target particular lignin chemistries, which are good for some applications. So what we did is we put the sample uh, uh, fabrication and characterization into a, a, loop, a Bayesian optimization loop. So based on some data, uh, we built uh, surrogate models and uh, computed the acquisition functions. And this told us which experiments to perform next. So we did four experiments in one batch because uh, they could do four experiments in one week. <laughs> so week after week, we adjusted our model and uh, gave recommendations for the next four experiments. And we did this in cycles until the models converge. And here is how that looks like. Uh, so here's the initial batch. We started with five data points. Uh, and what you see here is 
uh, the yield of lignin, so how much lignin was produced in the search space of the p-factor of the reaction, which describes severity, and temperature of the reaction. Um, and so when we did a batch of four experiments, we added it to the model. Now you can see the new experiments, uh, the old experiments are now in, in black, and the new data points that were predicted for the next experimental batch are added in green. So this is what the model looks like with nine data points, and you can see it's changing, and there's a region now of high yield and a low yield on, on both sides. So then we did another, we, ex we performed these four experiments, we added it to the model, and uh, now you can see how this model differs from the previous one. Uh, the area of high yield is basically moving up in parameter space. Um, so once again, the black points are now the old data, and the next, uh, the next samples should be evaluated at the green points. Uh, so we did these four experiments again, and now we had 17 experimental data points. And now you can see quite a change in the landscape in the sense that the, the maximum yield has moved into this top right area of the uh, processing parameter space. And then when we added the next four, this no longer changed. So you can clearly see between batch three and batch four that the, the landscapes converged. And this is how we knew we could stop with the experiment. And, and now we obtained uh, converged surrogate models. So only 20 experiments were needed to converge these models in, in the, the search space of two experimental variables. Uh, so from each experiment, we, or from each sample, we obtained not only yield information, but of course the chemistry of the lignin we were making. So here on the left, you see the uh, surrogate model for lignin yield. And here on the right is uh, the amount of beta O4 functional groups in this lignin, which marks a particular chemistry. And you can see these landscapes look completely different. It's in the same search space, but, but the landscapes are quite different. Uh, so the first thing the experimentalist was asked, had asked us is, can we obtain both high lignin yield and high beta O4 content? And of course, this is very difficult because the high yield is in the top right and the high beta O4 content is the top left. So how do you reconcile these two? So the way to do this, to satisfy multiple objectives, is to compute the Pareto front. Uh, these are all the Pareto points in the phase space of lignin yield versus beta O4. So uh, between these two variables. And the black points here, which are the, the front of the blue points, is what is called the Pareto front. And they represent the optimal trade-offs between these two properties. And what the trade-offs tell us is that if we want to maximize one thing, we have to minimize another. So let's say you want to create lignin that has 80% yield, but then we'll have to live with about 10 or 15 uh, units of beta O4. And if you really insist that you need high beta O4, so somewhere here, well, then you have to, you know, you're going to make like only 40 or 30% lignin yield. So that's, that's how to read this Pareto front. And you can map this Pareto optimal solution back onto the phase space of the experimental variables. And you see all of those points lie on the top, top um, uh, edge. And this is because we're looking for solutions that are along the top edge here on the right and here on the left. And so all the trade-offs lie in between these two. So now we could really do multi-objective optimization. Here you see four different properties. So here's the lignin yield and beta O4 you've seen before. They were also interested in chemistry of this SG ratio units and hydrocarbon content. And uh, we were considering how to put this together. I mean, mostly you always want lignin yield if you want to produce lignin for some applications. So if you target high yield and high beta O4, this lignin that's produced can be used for uh, as feedstock for aromatic chemicals. Uh, you can also look at high yield and low beta O4, which is kind of here is the optimal solution. This is ideal feedstock for antioxidants. Uh, so you can use lignin for antioxidants. Um, then uh, if you want a high yield and low SG ratio, which is here, uh, that type of lignin can be used for crosslinkers and a high yield and high hydrocarbon content, which is here, uh, makes lignin for surfactant applications. So from 20 experiments, we basically inferred information on how to adjust processing conditions to generate lignin for all these different kinds of applications. And I think this is the power of active learning and multi-objective optimization. Okay, uh, this is what we've done so far. And now we're, we're working on many different uh, new tools to integrate into these procedures. 
Uh, we now work with standard Bayesian optimization, but we also work, we've started a few years ago, a lot of work with multitask Bayesian optimization, where you can include different channels of information at the same time. So some tools we're integrating now into standard BO in BOSS is to account for material symmetry. Materials have lots of symmetries, which means if you sample once, you can use the symmetry to add multiple points uh, to your Gaussian process model. And this, of course, uh, accelerates the sampling considerably. Um, so another thing that you can do is use the information about energy gradients, which are, of course, forces that come out from our uh, atomistic simulations. And if you not only use the data, energy data, but also energy and gradients, you can fit surrogate models much faster. That is to say, with fewer data points. So using the gradient information that comes out almost for free from our calculations also accelerates BO and makes it much more data efficient. And lastly, uh, sometimes we don't want to sample in some regions of phase space. And so we're integrating these cost functions that forbid sampling in certain regions like this. Um, you can still fit surrogate models, but um, if, if you think that you can't do an experiment or your calculation would crash, then, um, then you can use this this uh, cost tool. On the multitask side, we have been working a lot with multi-fidelity BO, so I, I didn't want to present this yet, uh, where we are sampling um, for, for molecular, uh, oh sorry, for materials, energies, or, or properties from different uh, computer codes or from different simulation methods. So force fields are less accurate, but very, very cheap computationally, and then DFT is always on middle level and quantum chemistry is our top fidelity level. So it turns out that you can obtain answers uh, on these levels of theory simply by uh, supplementing uh, information with information from, from cheaper calculations. And then a, another application that I've just presented is multi-objective Bayesian optimization with Pareto fronts. And um, one thing we're looking at is, is now how to design acquisition functions that would directly target the, the uh, Pareto fronts and the optimal solutions. Okay, this is where I wanted to stop and summarize. Um, the the take-home message is that active learning and Bayesian optimization with Gaussian process regression is used to produce uh, these surrogate models for any kind of material property. And these are iteratively com converged, so you can be really confident of them. And this gives us this uh, structure to property relationships and allows us to infer optimal solutions. Um, it's extremely data efficient because it's it, uh, of this acquisition strategy that allows you to only sample the data that you absolutely need. Um, and so the, the data sets that result from active learning are really compact, relatively small, and what we call maximally informative. Um, again, I wanted to say that this from these surrogate models, you can just read off the optimal solution. So with mod modest computational cost, this is something you can obtain. And I hope that by now I've persuaded you that these are very versatile techniques. You can apply them to optimize almost anything <laughs> as long as you select the degrees of freedom and define the search space that is specific to the problem you're trying to solve. And lastly, it per, it's a method that permits multiple channels of information. And, and this, I think, is going to be very innovative in the years to come. So this code, by the way, is, is free and you can, uh, you can download it here and do the tutorials and learn how to use it and adapt it to your own problem. Everything is implemented in Python. And uh, before I stop, I wanted to acknowledge the Finnish Center for AI, which supports this work and also the Academy of Finland, which funds it and our uh, ever suffering uh, supercomputing facilities in Finland, uh, the CSC Center for Science. And um, I run the Materials Informatics Laboratory at the University of Turku, and we have lots of open positions all the time. So if you're interested in any of this work, uh, then feel free to contact me. And thank you very much for your attention. So thank you very much for a nice talk and very uh, wide range of application. So session is open now for questions. We can start there with a question from the chat. Maybe you can, uh, we can uh, say it and maybe start the discussion. Okay, Greg, I can see it actually here. Well, Greg uh, says, by using Bayesian optimization, can you give an estimation for the uncertainty of given geometry parameters too? Ah, uh, so I guess yes is the answer. Uh, let's see. 
what we compute are surrogate models. Uh, let me see. Right here. If, if we look at this landscape, that's the posterior mean, but of course you get the posterior variance everywhere in space at the same time, because you're right, Greg, this, this is what comes out from the Gaussian process posterior. Only by the time we really look at these uh, surrogate models to extract the properties, uh, the variance has almost vanished because um, we iterate them until they converge so that we can be really sure that they're correct. And by that time, all the variance almost goes to zero. So, it, but if you're at the start of building these models, let's say in the process of experimental um, uh, data acquisitions, um, so let's say here, we actually did compute the variance of the, of the Gaussian process surrogate model at each one of these uh, steps. And, uh, and we, that told us where the model was less certain. And of course that variance was used to compute the acquisition function that, that told us where to acquire the next experiment. So this acquisition function was exactly using this information of uncertainty in the parameter space to tell us which processing conditions haven't been sufficiently explored or in which processing conditions the optimal solutions might lie. So this is again, the exploration exploitation strategy. Um, so, so yes, you could uh, really extract the uncertainty as a function of these processing conditions and use that information to guide, guide the experiment. Thank you. Uh, some question in the room? Uh, hi, Milika. So I have a question. So I'm hi, Pablo. Um, nice talk. I have a question about this uh, uh, multi-fidelity uh, Bayesian optimization. So this is uh -huh. uh, done using some Cochrane approach or something else? Yes, you can call it like that. We are using the, uh, the linear model of corrigionalization. Um, so LMC model, and um, I I don't know if this this is exactly what is called co Kriging, but since since Kriging is usually basically Bayesian optimization based on GPR, I guess this is I'm not familiar what is co Kriging. Uh, what I wanted to say is that this is these LCM models and the IMC models that we're using, they are symmetric models of including different channels of information, which are very versatile. They can be used for multi-fidelity, but they can also be used for multi-objective. And they can also be used for multi-objective and multi-fidelity together. So they're very flexible um, GPR model structures with many layers of information. Um, and this is a different approach to, for example, delta learning, which we now see a lot in literature, which is a more an autoregressive approach, uh, and it assumes the hierarchy between tasks. So where delta learning kind of enforces the idea that one process has to be higher accuracy and one lower, then this ICM models and the LMC models we're using, uh, they treat all the, the levels of information as kind of equal in importance. And of course, we use it, we tell it that one is more important than the other, but, but it doesn't have to be so. So I hope I've explained a little bit what this framework is, but I'm not really sure if that's co cricking Okay, thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm David Levernia from Paris Saclay University. I just, do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you well. Yeah, I've got a question about you. Uh, so, most of them were about um, uh, dial angle. So, are you including mm -hmm. a periodic condition in your uh, in your Absolutely. Bayesian things? Okay. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. So Thanks. every time you know that your 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 um, search coordinate is periodic, uh, we use a periodic kernel. It's a periodic version of the RBF, and this uh, this is this basically allows you to tell Bayesian optimization that your problem is periodic, so it knows that at the, you know, if it samples both ends, it's the same solution. And because it already knows this, because the kernel already counts for this, uh, you, it's much more data efficient. You have to sample a lot of your data if you already use periodic kernels. So every single time we have a periodic uh, system, which doesn't only mean the dihedral angle, but also when you're moving your molecules around the surface, you only need to move it um, above a, a certain part of the, of the surface 
because everything else is the same. It's in, it's exactly periodic, right, everywhere. So, so then when we are also doing the struct the absorption search and, and these solid solid interfaces, it was also periodic problems with periodic kernels. So you're right, every time you have a periodic variable, you can integrate this via the kernel. And uh, we, can com we usually combine periodic and non-periodic kernels uh, together in a product kernel. So for example, if you're looking at the molecule above a surface, then the XYs are often periodic because of the cell periodicity. But if you go up and down in Z, that's a non-periodic variable. And then we use only RBF kernel. Thank you. Uh, I have one, oh, several, in fact, uh, for the attraction um, studies. Um, mm -hmm. uh, if I understand, uh, in both, you do some, uh, it is a second point DFT calculations. Yes. You generate, okay. Um, yes. What is the advantage of both if you compare with, with uh, some other approach to explore some attraction configuration, like molecular dynamics? or Monte mm -hmm. Carlo, yeah. because for example, yeah. Yeah. we could imagine so, for your full rain on uh, an ATAS that you can make a small Monte Carlo simulation. Exactly. And, yeah. and then you relax it uh, with DFT. You make a static mm -hmm. DFT relaxation after. Yeah. So very good question. Uh, we've thought ourselves the same when we started this work. Uh, so the thing about Monte Carlo, it's very powerful, um, but it doesn't keep track of where you have sampled. And it's agnostic to where are interesting regions, like low energy regions or high energy regions. It just samples, right? And it's the mm. next, the, and where you sample is not using any information of which regions are interesting and which regions are not. And so what happens with active learning is that uh, the, the GPR model, the surrogate model, keeps track of low energy regions and high energy regions. And the acquisition functions use this information and they do not sample in high energy regions, for example, at all. Mm. So you save the data, uh, you save the, the amount of sampling you would normally do in a Monte Carlo simulation um, with active learning, because you have this additional model, which is very relatively low overhead. And, and that, that keeps a history of the acquisitions where you have sampled, and it knows where you have previously sampled, so you don't sample there again. And it also knows um, which, interest, which regions of the phase space are interesting and which are not, and then it directs the acquisitions there. So that's, that's how it works with Monte Carlo. Um, another method that we were very hot on are minima hopping, because of course uh, it's really exhaustive. You're guaranteed to find a solution. Uh, but that method does too many relaxations for us. So it hops and then it relaxes, and then it hops and then it, it does a structural optimization. And you do a lot of these DFT steps in structural optimizations. Every time you hop, it's random. And, uh, and then uh, you might not be starting from a good geometry and you might take many steps to relax. And what we're doing here is the inverse. We are uh, fixing the building blocks and we're doing many of these um, informed single point calculations. And then we get these approximate landscapes that tell us which regions are promising and which aren't. And then in all the local minima, we, we do the relaxation only from the local minima. So we limit the number of structural relaxations that we do on purpose to only the regions where we think already the energy is low. And, and these are then the, the promising local minimum and the promising solutions. Okay. Does that answer better. Yeah, and that's better. I was really convinced by the solid solid interface when you graph because it's really uh, useful because I see the, the gain, but for the molecule on surface, it was more difficult to, to catch uh, the advantage. Yeah. Thank you. Um, some uh, questions? Um, so the other one it was also sometimes when you are at finite temperature in some attraction processes, you can be a room temperature or even more. Mm -hmm. Some uh, the attraction configuration is, is not the same as you have at DFT. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have maybe uh, to think to, uh, to it's some specific case, not I think the case of C C uh, your, your case you show today, but uh, mm -hmm. in some... Yeah, yeah. Uh, I understand what uh, you mean, because we, of course, uh, we think about that as well a lot. Uh, so I have to come back, I think, to the, the energy landscape here at the end. Um, once you learn this approximate energy landscape, and I should stress it's approximate because we use these building block approximations. Um, of course, and the y-axis is energy, right? So uh, as, you, as you fill up these minima, like in metadynamics, you kind of understand what's happening at elevated temperatures. Um, what, that, that information we can extract from here. What we cannot extract is kinetic effects and uh, okay. account for that. So when it comes to structure search there, I think 
that's a limitation of the method that I'm not sure we can overcome. But in any case, we are using it in only in ways where, where we, can, we can count on its strengths. Okay, yes, good, okay, thank you. So we have time for one more question. Okay, thank you. So we can thank you again, our speaker. Okay, thank you, Michael, and uh, have a nice day, everybody. Thank, thank you. So we have a coffee break and we start again at 10. Uh, okay. Thank